Hello everyone and welcome back to Network 27. I'm Alderman Walter Burnett, Alderman of 27 Ward. Uh, I don't have a lot of time on this show, but I have a special guest, uh, someone that I interviewed back in 2018. You probably can go into the archives and pull it up. Uh, they were running for county commissioner, uh, first time running for office, did a great job then. I know he's gonna do a great job now. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, acknowledge to all of you, the mayor of the city of Chicago, Mayor Brandon Johnson. What's up, bro? What's going on, Alderman? <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. Okay, welcome You left back. out one part, though. What's that? You're also the vice mayor of the city of Chicago. That's right. So, Alderman and vice mayor, the first black vice mayor in the history of the world. And thank you very much for giving me that title. <laughs> I appreciate course. it. The history of the world. <laughs> The not, whole wide world. Not just Chicago. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for coming of on, course. Mayor. So you've been mayor now for um, six months, almost seven months, um, and a lot of things been going on. So tell us what you've been doing, man. Yeah. So first of all, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to, to be on your show. And, you know, I'm just remembering the experience that I had you know, four or five years ago now, uh, when I was running for um, commissioner of the first district, representing the west side and the western suburbs, providing me with, with that opportunity to lay out my vision, um, I will always be grateful for that and, and likewise. And these first six months, almost seven months have been incredible. My wife and I um, are truly humbled and grateful that we are in a position to serve. I always say the greatest freaking city in the world. And when I was sworn in, I mean, there were uh, several challenges that I inherited right away. Um, we had wildfires um, in Canada, so smoke was coming into the city of Chicago. Uh, we had unprecedented rainfall um, that flooded the west side of Chicago primarily, but the western suburbs and the south side. Um, we have this migrant uh, mission or crisis that we've been dealing with, this international uh, population shift that's happening all over the globe. Obviously, people are concerned about public safety. Um, and we had a very audacious, bold agenda um, that I made a commitment to not just embracing, but carrying out um, as mayor of the city of Chicago. And so these first few months has really been about putting people in position that can help us lead. And I know we'll probably get a chance to talk a little bit more about the various divisions of, of government, um, but I am grateful to have a city council of leaders like yourself serving as vice mayor, the first time in the history of Chicago where um, the budget chair as well as the finance chair are led by black people. And so Alderman Jason Irvin, Alderwoman Pat Dow, finance chair. Uh, we have a corporate council that provides protection of, of our, our legal framework. Uh, Mary Richardson Laurie, the first black woman to serve in that capacity. And so there's been a lot of work being um, administered to make sure that we have the right people in position, people of color, black folks specifically, women leading government, and then of course confronting the challenges. And again, whether it was working with the state and the county and the federal government to get that federal declaration for the flooding, to provide resources for our people who have been struggling um, with a poor sewage system for some time. And so it's been that work. And then of course, um, working through how we uh, confront again, this international um, crisis of population shift. So just, and then I think the last thing that I think is important over these first six months, I've had the privilege of um, exploring the entire city of Chicago and from one end of the city to the other, um, black, brown, uh, Asian um, neighborhoods, white communities, and the type of activity that is happening in the city of Chicago, I really wish everyday Chicagoans could see the city of Chicago through the lens of the mayor. And so that's everything from neighborhood festivals, block parties, uh, Lollapalooza, uh, the Taste of Chicago, uh, the Hyde Park Fest, where um, you know we had some incredible artists come in from around the country to provide that hope and aspirations for people, as well as contributing to our local economy. And then, of course, I've had a chance to come home every night, make sure I take the trash out, put the kids to bed, and say our prayers. So it's been a great journey so far. Fantastic. So, so Mayor, I know there were some things you had on your agenda when you were running for mayor, and it looked like you've, you've accomplished a lot of them already. I, I know stuff dealing with things dealing with uh, uh, mental health, uh, homelessness, affordable housing. Why don't you tell us about some of those things and, and, and what you've been doing to work on those things? Yeah, I'll start with, um, you know, mental health. That's uh, very important for me. 
I've shared this in um, this personal story, and I know there are a number of us who represent the people of Chicago that have similar experiences with loved ones who've struggled with mental health um, that have been brought on by um, addiction. And my oldest brother, Leon, who is, you know, my hero, um, had mental health uh, challenges. And unfortunately, um, because of his addiction, the, it was the way in which he tried to escape the pain that he was suffering with. And unfortunately, he died addicted and unhoused. And so for me, um, investing in mental health is not just, you know, this resource that I want for the people of Chicago in a generic way. I want this resource because I know the impact that um, mental health has on our families. And so, you know, a couple of administrations ago, there was a decision that was made to close down mental health clinics. Uh, my budget um, uh, reinstates and opens up two um, of our public health facilities that will serve as mental health uh, centers. Um, because, you know, look, the, the amount of trauma that families have experienced over the course of generations, for a variety of reasons, whether it's just been, you know, the lack of quality education, the lack of jobs, um, and just other environmental elements that have led to, you know, really um, uh, exacerbating the trauma that families endure, it was important to me to not just make that commitment and that promise, but also to treat that trauma. You know, many of your viewers, I'm sure, will remember um, uh, several years ago now when Quantonio Legreer came home um, from Northern um, during the holiday break, right around this time. And he had a mental health crisis and he and his neighbor ended up dead, um, shot by police. Um, as Betty came to his defense, um, both of them are now dead. And so to that point, one of the other dynamics within this budget that we address is not just opening up our ment mental health clinics, but having an alternative response to mental health crises. Uh, when people call 911 for a mental health crisis, the only response is a policing response. 40% of the 911 calls that come through are really mental health crises. And so our budget speaks to um, addressing the mental health crises cause with mental health professionals. And so I'm moving with some expediency around this element because it does a couple of things. One, it, it, it treats the trauma. Two, it takes the pressure off of law enforcement of having to respond to mental health crises. Um, and then three, by taking police officers away from this particular element of service, it frees law enforcement up to, to, to respond to more severe um, crises that are, that are violent or, or, or dangerous, right? So that's been my focus over the first six months around mental health. So that kind of ties right into uh, you uh, hiring more, more civilians to work at the police department. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's been this really <laughs> robust debate in Chicago, which I'm all for, around what role does policing have and what is the appropriate number of law enforcement so that people are not just feeling safe, but they're really experiencing safety. And what I've heard from the community is not just relieving police officers from these mental health crises calls. It's also putting police officers back on the front line where they can be of the type of service that the people of Chicago want. And so administratively, there have been tasks that law enforcement has been asked to carry out that civilians can do. So within this budget, we take 400 positions we create a civilianization um, uh, component or element around those positions. And ultimately what that's gonna do, that's gonna free up those 400 officers that were providing these administrative duties that civilians can do. It's gonna free up these officers to actually be connected into the community. And it also creates job opportunities, right? Um, we know that unemployment in Chicago is still at a point where um, it's, it's caused tremendous stress economically within communities. And so these positions, um, there are people that I know in the city of Chicago that have talent, that want to contribute to our economy, and part of their contribution, they want to do it through the lens of community safety. This provides them with an opportunity to be a part of community safety without necessarily um, doing policing. So police officers get to police, the community gets to lend its support and brilliance um, to community safety by providing support to these positions that police officers once were really bogged down by. 
So when you talk about creating jobs, mm -hmm. so you made a pledge to have more summer jobs for kids in the city of Chicago. Tell us about that. So this is the joy of my work. You know, many people know, um, if they don't know, that I spent you know a good portion of my professional career as a public school teacher. Um, you know, before, of course, um, I was teaching um, in Cabrini. You and I met um, during my time working at the New City YMCA. Um, in Cabrini Green, youth development is where you know I've spent my time studying my bachelor's degree, um, a master's degree in teaching. So young people and investing in young people is a major part of my administration because I know that when we are investing in people, particularly our young people, that is ultimately what's going to lead towards a better, stronger, safer Chicago. So within the first few weeks of my administration, um, we ramped up our youth hiring. We were able to hire almost 25,000 young people this summer, 25,000 young people. And these were um, paid positions. That's an uptick of 20% of youth employment from the previous year. And then what we did this year in our budget, um, I've appropriated 76 million more dollars to youth hiring. Um, so this is gonna put us on the pathway uh, to hire almost 30,000 young people this summer. Here's why that number is critical though, Alderman. Um, 45,000 young people applied for summer positions, and we were only able to fill 25,000 of those, those aspirations. So this notion that young people are not interested in working or contributing to society is just false. We have the data to prove it. And so we have a lot of work to do. I've made a commitment to doubling the amount of young people that we hire uh, for summer positions, creating year round positions for young people to contribute and, and, and to uh, remain connected to government. And so the $76 million is gonna put us in a position to hire conservatively 4,000 more young people. And we're gonna to continue to budget for the interest uh, of our young people. The last number that I think is important to, to highlight, of the 25, almost 25,000 young people that receive summer employment, 65% of them were black children. And I'm lifting that up because look, you and I met again in my work in Cabrini and teaching um, the hopes and aspirations of young people, particularly black children, unfortunately, um, you know, have been um, disrupted and interrupted. And, you know, whether it's providing after school um, opportunities for children or what the former secretary, uh, Jesse White, um, has done his investment in young people. By the way, we all know that he was a teacher as well. And that's why we need more teachers in charge of government. Uh, that's my p plug for public educators. But um, hiring young people and investing in them, um, that is what I know is going to lead towards a better, stronger and much safer Chicago. So so you, you talked about jobs with the with the youth. You talked about jobs at the police department. So there, are there any new businesses coming to the city in relationship to jobs? Yeah, so this is where I'm also very much excited. You know, the, the unique thing about Chicago, and I really want people to, to grasp this, I know we have our challenges, and I'm not oblivious to those challenges that we have, but there are so many opportunities in the city of Chicago. One of the things that I think it's important to just lift up, our economy is incredibly diverse. There's not one industry that has more than 15% of the overall economy of, of, of the city of Chicago. And because our economy is so diverse, it provides us with the flexibility that we need to invest in a variety of businesses and economic opportunities. And so one of the things that we did right away, particularly within our hospitality industry, um, we expanded right away um, was um, outdoor dining. Um, expanding those opportunities for businesses um, to be able to create more room in their in, in their various restaurants. That's going to lead to hiring more people. It's going to create more revenue and generate more revenue so that we can invest in mental health and youth employment. We've also created an opportunity where um, urban agriculture, so you're seeing all these um, in many of our neighborhoods, uh, particularly on the west and south side of Chicago, where we're getting back to you know some of our roots, right? And so the the the, the urban farms that have been uh, proliferating all over the city of Chicago, there's been limitations in how they can. Um, I guess one way to put it, export or to sell those products. So we've created an ordinance and opportunity for urban farmers, agriculture, to actually sell their produce. Um, and, and of course it's regulated, but that's another way in which we're generating revenue, creating opportunities for small businesses. Same thing with patios for, for breweries. Um, but the big investments that I'm really excited about, um, Google, 
um, setting up its headquarters in the city of Chicago, uh, Quinn Primo, um, a developer, um, a black man who is committed to, to, to expanding the opportunities for young people and just workers in Chicago, a billion dollar investment. Um, uh, we have a, another developer and business leader, uh, the only black owned steel company, New Horizon, um, um, expanded um, um, his capacity. Um, we have companies like Invenergy. Um, these, these are folks who are into clean technology. Um, they've expanded their footprint. They have opened up 86,000 more square feet uh, within their, their framework. And so that's going to attract even more individuals to be a part of their corporation. And so there are so many opportunities, particularly because the city of Chicago has not just a diverse economy. We have some of the best minds in Chicago. Our universities are some of the top universities in the country, and many of our universities complete, uh, compete globally as well. So we have great talent, great universities. Um, we have transportation, whether it's rail or two you know, major airports. Um, and then of course we have you know, individuals with the type of creativity to expand business that ultimately is gonna lead towards a better, stronger, safer Chicago. And so whether it's mental health care services, um, youth employment, or making sure that our small businesses and our larger businesses have an opportunity to thrive, that's what I've been up to these last six months. So also, so, so we have to remove our lead pipes. Mm -hmm. So we're removing our lead pipes. Are those going to bring, is that going to bring opportunities for jobs in the city of Chicago? Yeah, so I'm glad you lifted that up because as I talk about this diverse economy, that whether it's manufacturing, logistics, um, the, the medical bio hub that we are, that we have in Chicago with this investment from uh, uh, Zuckerberg, we also have to make sure that we're creating opportunities for individuals to get into the trades, right? And so we have a problem with a real opportunity to not just provide a solution to the problem, but you actually create even more economic opportunities through the solution. So Chicago is, in, in fact, Chicago has the most lead pipes um, that are attached to homes than anywhere else in the country. I believe there's like 400,000 um, families, homes that are impacted by these lead pipes. And so working with our um, congressional leadership, I've had the opportunity to work with Senator Duckworth on this issue and Senator Durbin, where we received an, an, an initial uh, $396 million, $400 million to start removing lead pipes from essentially the west and south sides of Chicago. That's where there's a higher concentration. I've also contributed with our current budget millions of dollars to, to, to begin to move, to remove these, these, the, the lead pipes from the homes. With that being said, these are job opportunities for our people, due to the, the question that you're raising. And so working with our, our laborers and our, our unions to uh, create even more opportunities for apprenticeship programs, training that will ultimately lead towards good paying jobs. The last thing that I'll say there is that there are black owned companies that have some capacity to participate in this opportunity as well. And so it's not just the city and labor, it's also small businesses that could take a block or two blocks or a neighborhood to remove these lead pipes hire our people to do it. So not only are you creating a healthier environment by investing in people with these jobs that ultimately creates a safer environment as well, because the surest way to create a better, stronger, safer Chicago is to invest in people. And when people are economically secure, um, it el eliminates and it removes those barriers and access to capital, which ultimately leads towards economic stability and safe communities. So I know you got a plan for affordable housing. <clears throat> and I know that you're trying to uh, keep things moving that were initially uh, talked about, right? And so you're finding the money for those things to happen. And from what I understand, you're, you're getting ready to do a creative financial bonding thing uh, to start funding those. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the, the, the part that is exciting about the city of Chicago, Alderman, is that, and I know folks might, might be surprised to hear this next data point, Right now, the city of Chicago, it's about 2.7 million of us in the city. But Chicago has a room for 700,000 more people. 
I know it may not feel like that when you're driving to work or you're riding somewhere in the city, but we have such an opportunity to create more affordable living space for people. One of the challenges that we've experienced though over time, especially with developers who really want um, to create more affordable housing, it's been the cost to develop the property. And part of that cost is also attached to having some capital on the front end to be able to start the project knowing that at some point the city will reimburse, right? And so having um, creative bonding as well as setting up micro grants and not just loans provides the type of initial capital that could be used to jumpstart these projects because the need is tremendous. 68,000 roughly in the city of Chicago, 68,000 people are currently unhoused of which 20,000 of them are students who attend our public schools. Not to mention you have people working every single day and it's hard for them to keep up with their rent. And so having affordable housing not only provides economic stability, it creates jobs for developers, but also everyday people who are either going into to be an electrician, a plumber, a drywall, a carpenter, Housing in and of itself, creating affordable housing, creates a pathway to a stronger city. Simply because, again, people can afford to live here and it creates economic stability for families to actually participate in that development. So, Mayor, so we got about 10 minutes left, but I just want to, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, putting in a budget uh, for the Department of Returning Residents and also you did it for reparations also. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate, you know, the, um, the gratitude, but really that doesn't happen without, without your leadership. And you've been, you know, very clear about why it's important to have affordable housing um, and having um, economic opportunities for, for the people of Chicago, but you've also been clear about how do we make sure we're, we're, we are restoring people. And again, I, this is also personal for me. And as I shared with my, my, my older brother, I've had a number of relatives um, who have, you know, went down a pathway of, of despair and they've paid their time uh, or their debt to society as, as if you will, but they're constantly, constantly being punished because of something that happened in their, in their past. And this office, this office for reentry, I really want to lift up your leadership in the Black Caucus for really pushing, um, you know, for this office is because, you know, where I live, everybody knows I live on the west side of Chicago and in Austin, a beautiful community. We love it. My wife and I were grateful that we're able to live in a community with so much history, one of the greatest concentration of black families anywhere in the country. The Austin neighborhood, it's, you know, roughly 80, 85,000 people. I mean, we're the size of other small to other towns in this, in, this, in this state. And it is one of the number one locations where those who are formerly incarcerated are returning to. And they're staying on relatives is couches, they're in basements, and they don't have the opportunity to be restored. And so this office is dedicated to creating and finding opportunities for these men and women to be restored so that they can become productive um, residents of the city of Chicago. And, you know, this conversation around reparations, you know, I had the privilege of not just teaching in Chicago and teaching at Jenner Academy and Westinghouse on the West Side. I'm a social studies teacher. And we all know the history of, of not just slavery, but how jails and incarceration were also used to um, create barriers um, for our people to to have real dignity, and it's 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 well past time that as government, you know, we have to make it very clear that if we're really serious, and I am, about bringing real restoration and hope uh, to Black folks in particular that we have to have a real honest dialogue around reparations and what that looks like. And so I'm a big proponent of universal basic income. This is something that um, guaranteed income. This is something that President, former President Obama 
um, has been pushing. There are a number of mayors around the country. We had a pilot who support um, guaranteed income. Uh, there was a pilot program on the county side when I served as a county commissioner. I know there's, there was a pilot on the city side as well. Um, that pilot has ex expired. 75% roughly of those who are receiving um, the, the guaranteed income were black, mostly women. Um, and what we have found and discovered as, as a form of reparations, it actually not only helped set some economic stability, it did not create the dependency in which detractors were saying that it would cause. It actually strengthened people because they were able to have some certainty um, of how to make financial decisions. So, you know, the Office of Reentry and there's a real dedicated amount of money um, to restoration and reparations, that is the jumpstart that we're gonna need to really repair the damage that has been um, um, administered and quite frankly, in, in a, probably in a very provocative way, executed against our people. And my administration is committed to really restoring and providing some hope for our people. So we got, we got a few more minutes. I know we got the Democratic Convention coming up. That's a big deal for the city of Chicago. Can you tell us what's happening with that? Yeah, so the Democratic National Convention, so next summer in August, um, there will be 50,000 roughly delegates from all over the country here in Chicago as, you know, I prepare to help President Biden, um, you know, uh, receive another term. But just economically, though, it's going to be a real opportunity for us to show off the city of Chicago. Look, we have one of the fastest growing downtowns, if not the fastest growing downtowns anywhere in the country. Mondays and Fridays, metro rides are up in the city of Chicago. Again, we're experiencing growth. There's some real economic opportunities for the city. And so individuals that have small businesses, um, individuals that provide any type of service, you know, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's retail or, or um, hospitality, these opportunities will be available. And I really want to show off all of the 77 neighborhoods that make us the greatest city in the world. Fantastic. So, May, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the show. Do you have anything in particular that you got coming up that you got planned for the city that 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 we don't know about or the news don't know about? I want to get it here first. You yeah, so, some breaking news. So here's something that I think is I think the people of Chicago, we need to have a little bit more fun. I mean, look, times are difficult. There are challenges in the city, but it should not stop us from enjoying each other's company. And so I want this holiday season to be to be safe and to be filled with joy. And so I'm working on making sure that Chicago can become a real destination for, for New Year's Eve. And so people should just stay tuned that um, hopefully we can restore some of that um, vibrancy downtown, even as we make downtown more residential and affordable housing even downtown. And so over the next, um, several months we're going to be really be exploring how we can use some of the space downtown for affordable housing and to attract more events so people can come out and enjoy this city you know whether it's again uh, festivals concerts um, all of that is healthy for the vibrancy of our city because it fills up our hotels, it fills up our restaurants, we generate revenue, which allows us to pour resources into our schools, our public health system, our transportation system. All of that ecosystem is tied um, uh, to our ability to create a, a better, stronger, safer Chicago. So New Year's Eve, Chicago, let's part of us have a good time, but let's also make sure that all of our neighborhoods in the city are fully supported. And that's what I'm committed to doing as mayor for the next 23 years and six months. Fantastic, Mayor. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the show. Uh, this is probably one of the uh, first time that you and I have had conversations like this, and you didn't talk about me and make jokes. You know what I'm saying? So, so, <laughs> so I should go ahead and get my crack in right now. Or you should be in the show before I play back. <laughs> All right, man. Mr. Vice Mayor. All right, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching Network 27. I'm Alderman Burnett, Vice Mayor Burnett. In the city of Chicago, we want to thank our guest, the mayor of the city of Chicago, Mr. Brandon Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. See you next month.